this is Big Bus. And Big Bus is trying to kill me. Good. It's 1989, and following the undeserved success of the NES port of Metal Gear, an awful game, inferior in every way to its MSX counterpart that somehow also sold over a million copies in the US alone, Konami greenlit a sequel to the NES version. This version was being worked on with an eye toward releasing it specifically for Western audiences, and during that same year, Hideo Kojima was on a train in Tokyo when he met a colleague of his that happened to be working on this NES sequel to Metal Gear. After some discussion, this co-worker then asked Kojima to make a true sequel to the 1980 1987 MSX original, to which Kojima's response was presumably Nani? See, much like the original NES port of Metal Gear, Metal Gear 2 Snake's Revenge had been commissioned without Kojima's knowledge or involvement, and this should be a surprise to no one if you're even passingly familiar with how Konami does business. The story goes that by the end of the train ride, Kojima had already hashed out a main plot, which he then took to the Konami bosses the next day with a game plan, and it was almost immediately approved. So yeah, if you've been paying attention, that means that two different Metal Gear 2s were in simultaneous development at one point. And while I can't find anything that definitively proves or states this as fact, I posit the following. Metal Gear for the NES had predominantly been released in the West, which is what they were planning for Metal Gear 2 Snake's Revenge, while Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake would only really be released in Japan and maybe a limited release in Europe. This way there would be no chance for confusion as different regions would only be able to feasibly access one version of the game. Remember, this was the late 80s. Game publishers in Japan were just doing whatever the hell they wanted. To give you an idea of just how insane Japan was around this time, the head of Microsoft Japan commissioned a special effects artist to create a life-size dinosaur to hang out during an MSX Expo, to the tune of over 1 million US dollars. This was a publicity stunt done for seemingly no real reason. It's not like a dinosaur was the mascot for the MSX or was even associated with the MSX, and the man behind the decision made this call without his bosses at Microsoft knowing. So to put it in perspective, the expectation of a new IP being carefully set up and structured to carry a series of 5 to 10 games plus spin-offs, that shit hadn't been established yet, it was too forward thinking for the time. Hell, Kojima reportedly hadn't even considered a sequel at all to Metal Gear until that fateful train ride. There is a timeline where that separate Metal Gear continuity is still going to this very day, and I have a feeling that it would nonetheless still end up at Rising. Going into the development of this title, Kojima's goals were to significantly expand on the stealth elements of the original Metal Gear and improve enemy AI, with the intention of making a more realistic simulation of espionage and infiltration. Kojima and his team dove deep into military history and roleplay, amassing a collection of items that were used as reference for the in-game art, some of which were even photographed for the manual. They went into the mountains to play laser tag, walked around in military fatigues, and practiced crawling around, the doing of which was apparently the basis for some of Snake's crawling sprites, and even met with a former Green Beret. I can't find any details about that last bit and what was talked about, but I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall as these bright-eyed young developers had their world shook by the horrors detailed by a grizzled old war vet. More importantly, however, and though I haven't been able to find this stated anywhere by Kojima himself, this is also where the series becomes decidedly weirder in a very deliberate way. Metal Gear may have been the genesis of the series, but Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake is the crucible in which its best memes were forged. We have cutscenes now, which means the Metal Gear series is charging headlong into a wall of story and lore, get ready for that. It's the late 1990s, if you listen to the game. The manual. Oh. Oh, and we'll get to the manual. Says it's specifically 1999. The cliff notes are that the Cold War is over. Nations around the world are de-arming their nuclear weapons and the world might finally know peaceful ones. However, a junta in Central Asia takes over a region called Zanzibar Land, which then raids a bunch of nuclear disposal sites around the globe to collect working news. Now standing as the only nuclear power in the world, they're just starting to invade everyone around them. Also, the world is running out of oil. The game's intro cutscene says it's happening 30 years sooner than expected, while the manual says it's due to 
happen in roughly 30 years time, but we could probably split the difference and just say that shit's fucked. One Dr. Kiro Marv, Czech biologist, develops Oilix, which the game says produces petroleum grade hydrocarbons and the manual says rectifies high quality oil. And I gotta tell you friends, I don't know which of these is exactly accurate, but there's gonna be a lot more of this going forward. A lot of Trek level sci-fi talk that may or may not be bullshit. And since finishing high school was a thing that happened to other people, I don't have the capacity to tell you if any of it is accurate. So consider my disbelief suspended. Everyone wants Dr. Mars magic oil whatevers. So much so that while on route to the US, the good doctor is abducted by Zanzibar lad, the leaders of which intend to hold the world hostage through the control of oil and probably those nukes they stole from everyone. Solid Snake, currently retired, as you would be after almost single-handedly saving the world from a nuclear armed paramilitary force, is brought back into the field by Foxhound's new commanding officer, Roy Campbell, to infiltrate Zanzibar land and rescue Dr. Marv. All of this and the events that followed would all be later referred to as the Zanzibar land disturbance, which seems a, a bit light for what is effectively a rogue nation threatening the world of nuclear annihilation. So, to summarize in case it escaped you, a European scientist is kidnapped by an aggressive terrorist force based out of a militarized fortress nation so they can develop advanced weapons technology that the terrorists plan on using to control the world. And then Solid Snake is sent in to take care of stuff, yet you know, I'm starting to see how Kojima knocked this out in a single train ride. Snake is more flexible than he was in the last game, crouching and crawling around, which means you can hide in the environment, crawl through it, things that are important for avoiding guards. These ones are much more capable than their outer heaven counterparts, you see. For a start, they're not essentially blind. Their vision is now a wide cone shape from the direction that they're looking in, and they can turn their heads. So now you can't just rely on whichever direction they're facing, you've got to keep a sharp eye out for whichever way they're looking. They're also able to patrol entire areas now, not just a single screen, with scripted routes that they'll follow around the base, and walking on weird flooring or otherwise making noise will send them searching around the screen for you. I think they're meant to move in the general direction of the noise when this happens, but it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes they just stand still and look around, which can still be an issue if you time your movement wrong. You know, we've gone from tailgating guards for fun in the last game to being afraid of walking in their general direction now, which I guess was probably always the intention. And it does put a greater emphasis on actually hiding instead of fighting your way through. The alert system has also been improved. Now there's an alert phase where guards will abandon their patrols to teleport in from the sides of the screen or out of room that they weren't actually in and swarm all over your position. Then after that, there's the evasion phase where they're not sure of your exact position and search around for you, which gives you a chance to hide somewhere until the alert timer runs out. They didn't totally redesign everything though. Some things have changed, but some things are still the same. You can wait them out or you can just kill the entire search team. And sometimes this means that you'll run to a different screen to try and escape, but you'll be stuck in a straight corridor that stretches on for a few screens with nowhere else to hide, and so a guard will just keep coming up behind you and sending off the alert again and oh yeah, and every time you set off an alert, it pauses the game a moment to be sure that you're aware. It's only a little annoying. This is probably why crouching and crawling was added, because if you can put some distance between you and the enemy, then hide under something, it'll eventually clear the alert and you can go back to bumbling around the base you just revealed your presence to, Mr. Secret Agent Super Spy. It's not a perfect system though, because once you're underneath something, you can only move up or down, there's no side to side movement. So if a guard sees you go under something, then they'll know that you're there. They can't hurt you, but you can't really go anywhere except out the exact same way that you went in, and so... Yeah, don't do that. This is also the first time in the series that you have a radar available. No, not you, get the fuck out of here. It's pretty rudimentary and you can only tell the direction that guards are facing based on whether or not they just moved in that direction, which makes walking into the same screen as them a little dicey sometimes. And your radio is somewhat useful now. There's also a whole new support crew for this mission. We've got Colonel Roy Campbell, your superior officer, the new commander of Foxhound. We'll assume for the moment that he's legit and not secretly trying to take over the world. Master Miller, who gives you survival and technical advice. What a thrill. His skills are unquestionably good, however his work history is kind of concerning and we'll get into that later. And George Kassler, expert mercenary expert, as in he is both an expert about mercenaries and also an expert mercenary. He's your Diane for this game, but not quite so useless and generally much more present. There's a few more characters along the way, but we'll get to them as they come up. 
Instead of just having scripted dialogue depending on the room you're in like the last game, they'll change up what they say each time you call them, sometimes keeping it context dependent. You know, within limits, this was still the MSX. So that's most of the major changes from the last game, let's get into it. Five steps in. Campbell calls you to give you the rundown on Operation Intrude F014, finding Dr. Marv and how you can use the new radar to do it. Referring to it as having a 9 screen radius, that phrasing is a red flag for me. The last Foxhound commander who broke the fourth wall like that also kept trying to abduct me in trucks or kill me in pit traps. He tells you to keep an eye out for a red dot on the radar because Dr. Marv has a transmitter implanted in one of his molar teeth and then gives you his frequency so that you can stay in touch from that point. Now to just gracefully sneak into the base. So while we're making our way into the base, we can stop in this truck outside here to pick up a pistol. Hmm. Feels like I've done that before. Then head up from there, crouch down, and crawl into this foreboding vent. At one point in development, this heartbeat sound was going to be present throughout the game, with all other sound being removed. But this was pulled from the game and only shows up in these shafts. Notes from a round table of the development team, found in a pullout that came with the soundtrack album for the game because even finding information about the development of the game feels like digging into a conspiracy. The devs said that the sound chip they were developing with couldn't produce the sounds they wanted. I suspect that there may have been other reasons that this was changed, like it being fucking stupid. But keep this factoid about the heartbeat thing in mind as we go further into the game because it only gets weirder as you go on and remember that there were meant to be no other sounds. Anyway, if you head over to the left and then up, you'll come out to a dead end. And if you go back in and take the exit to the south, you'll probably fall out of the van and back outside. Metal Gear 2 likes to do this kind of thing sometimes. You think that was annoying? No, that's just the game's way of saying hello. You haven't seen anything yet. So get back into the van over here and go past the trick route to enter the base hangar and five steps in. It's... Holly White, a journalist who infiltrated Zanzibar land a month ago. She calls you to tell you she knows how things work around here, and I'll fucking bet you do. This is meant to be a secret mission. How did you get my frequency? Are you related to Jennifer? I've barely started my mission, and there's already an intelligence leak. I need, I need to call the colonel and tell him about this. That's strike two, colonel. What about you, Miller? Oh, okay, I... I guess it's just Foxhound protocol to break the fourth wall now. You're pretty much left to your own devices to explore and stumble around at the beginning here, but let me break it down for you. There's six levels in the first building. You enter on level one, which has two lifts, but you can only access the right one from this level. You can take the right one up to levels two, three, and four, and on level two, you can switch to the left elevator, go down to the two basement levels, but not levels one, three, and four. Are you still following? This is how it starts. Let's just be thankful that these lifts go in both directions. Switch elevators and head down to the first basement level where you're gonna pick up the infrared goggles, which I never used for the rest of the game. Then we're getting out at level two, where there's an open doorway into an empty room with a car key just laying out in the middle of the room because Zanzibar land has unparalleled security. Vigorously trained soldiers, as you'll see. There's nothing else for us here. We can't even get into level four and the rest of the basement levels are just as inaccessible right now. I, wait, what was that? Colonel, what was, uh, okay, okay, never mind. Holly, help me out here. Is it? Firstly, this feels like another out of heaven situation where it's suddenly not clear whether Zanzibar land refers to a whole state or just this base or whatever, but also why are there children in a military base in the middle of a nuclear standoff? Level three it is then, and if we head up to the side in a bit, we find... Oh no. And then if we head down to the south end of the floor, Hey, wait, look, it's the red dot that the colonel told us to look out for. Okay, so let's head on over there and... 
shit, shit, shit. Not again, not again. Need to get through the... Come on, come on before the oxygen runs out. Come on! <sighs> Sweet Jesus. Okay. All right, scientist guy. Let's... Oh, fuck. I don't know where this is going. So fake Marv here tells you that they're tapping into your radio because the tech is so fucking old. No wonder Holly found my frequency. The whole base has probably been listening to me from the moment I arrived. Are you running on a shoestring budget, Colonel? Or is this some kind of they'll never see it coming logic? Okay, fine. So what now? Another pit trap? The room's gonna flood with guards for me to fight? There's gonna be dogs with guards in their mouths and when they bark I fall onto pit traps? Is that it? What? Did you think the first game's boss fights were too easy? Well fuck you, here's a pistol, go fight a literal ninja in the first 20 minutes of the game. By the way, he's from NASA's Extraterrestrial Environment Special Forces Unit. I hope that's not a problem for you. The Black Ninja fight is kinda like the Hind D fight from Metal Gear 1, if it had bull tank speed and could teleport. Between flickering around the room, he'll stop to throw a stream of throwing stars at you, which can hit you twice between iframes if you really botch the timing, and these things aren't fucking around about how much health they'll take off. But wait, what about our not Diane? To get his number, you have to call the colonel during a boss fight, and he'll tell you that Kazler is an expert on Foxhound's tab, but not to mention whale cuisine to him, which is a reference to a completely different game called Snatcher, which we're not gonna go into right now. Calling Kazler, he reinforces that this dude is, in fact, from some weird NASA paramilitary unit, and even calls him an astronaut. Okay. And somehow this means he's not a pro like Snake in Kazla because astronauts are notoriously known for being fuck ups of course. So he tells you to just wait and watch what he does which translates to waiting around for an opening where you can stop, pop off a single shot and then keep moving before you get hit by ninja stars. It's gonna take you a few tries. And when you land your final hit, he crawls to the center of the room and calls out to you. But wait, how does he know your name? Because he's actually Kyle Schneider, the Outer Heaven Resistance leader from Metal Gear 1. He also tells you that you're an accessory to war crimes. Because while Snake was busy running away from the Outer Heaven base that was presumably about to explode from his own self-destruct sequence, NATO wanted to make damn sure it definitely was destroyed and proceeded to bomb the absolute shit out of the place. It's also implied that they did this with the full knowledge of there being resistance fighters and children in the region, with the bombing being something of a quick and dirty solution to that fact. Because if NATO had done things right, they'd have to rehome a bunch of orphans or something, and, and that sounds like more work than just writing them off as collateral damage. He almost but not quite reveals that the person who rescued him from out of heaven was exactly who you think it is. Then, in his final moments, Kyle tells Snake that there's no hate between them, and how he can find Dr. Marv by trailing a guard in the base who's wearing a green beret. And then he explodes! Dude, this is... This is a lot of heavy shit to take in all at once. I, I need to set something straight. Colonel, did you hear all that? Do you know about any of this? What does that mean?